Hi, welcome everybody. I'm just going to ask um, the wonderful Maya signature if this is working and if you can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, th this form is so wonderful and strange. Uh, you know, it's always worth just acknowledging how weird it is that I'm looking into a green dot that represents a lot of people, um, but I can't see you or hear you. It's a little bit like Black Mirror, uh, the show. Uh, so just acknowledging that before beginning and trying to imagine you here with me in a, in a space, in a classroom, in a theater uh, where we can talk about poetry and playwriting. Uh, so I'm gonna do the best I can with the technology. I also hope my dog does the best she can and doesn't bark during our time together. Uh, so my name is Sarah Rule and I'm one of Signature's resident playwrights. Um, we're going to do some reading and writing of, of poetry together. And the thought about looking at um, poetry and playwriting together came from Paige Evans, um, partly from a piece I wrote in the New York Times about poetry during pandemic times. And the idea for the piece was based on the fact that Shakespeare during his plague, when his theaters were closed, started to write poetry. I mean, he'd always written poetry, but he turned to poetry and wrote Venus and Adonis at that time. And I do think there's something about the short form uh, when the mind is so bedeviled um, and besieged by the pandemic and by um, world leaders. Uh, it, it's very hard to think, very hard to concentrate. For me, I find hard to concentrate on a sort of imaginary world that sustains itself, but poetry is a little bit easier to focus on, and I do think brings um, some solace right now. Uh, and I also don't think there's a huge distinction between poetry and playwriting. For me, the worlds are very close, and I, I started as a poet and then moved into playwriting. Uh, so it seemed, it seemed fun to put the two together today for a workshop. So. Obviously, I've never done a writing workshop online before. So in terms of logistics, uh, I'm going to share a couple of poems with you. Then we'll do some exercises. And then I'm going to ask you to share your pieces if you feel like it, um, maybe a couple per exercise. And to do that, apparently there's a little raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen, which you can press. And then later, when we're done sharing with, with exercises, we'll have a question and answer portion and there's a question and answer um, button that you can use for that. And Maya, um, who's setting all of this up at Signature can call questions and um, unmute you and um, give them to me. Um, so first, let me start by sharing a poem with all of you. Forty-four poems for you. And it's a book of poems that are mostly poems of address. Uh, but this one happens to be kind of a prayer or an invocation to slowness. And I think we all need to celebrate slowness as best we can right now. So I'll read that before we begin. Prayer. Let the day open slow around you. Let the night open slow around you. Let the spring open slow the fall open slow, the waking animals open slow around you. Let the night close slow around you. Let the day close slow around you. The winter close slow, the summer close slow, the sleeping animals close slow around you. And I'll just read one more poem and then we'll get started. Um, I'm sheltering in place in Rhode Island right now which is a, a wonderful place that I lived for about seven years um, prior to living in Brooklyn. And in honor of being in Rhode Island right now, I'm gonna read this poem, uh, which is a sonnet and it's called Summer Rhode Island. You know what a lee is, I don't. Behind a stone, no wind, stop boat, a place. Behind your back, my body, stop the air. Travel by stopping, full stop, just there. As Lee is a small world, word, sail easy. Lee and unlee, light is hot. Rest here a while longer on my belly. A lee, a dry dairy, a drought. August, marsh sounds, marsh looks, a fairy. 
Look for other words, lucid, pellucid, call a mind a pond, call a pond a mind, lucid, penitent mendicants on a pond. Words for clarity, words for light and heat, words for charity, words for sleep. Okay, so the first exercise I want us all to do together, and I'm hoping you all have this old technology with you, this ancient, you know, pen and paper technology, because it's easier to do this um, exercise that way. This, this is an exercise given to me by my wonderful friend, the playwright and poet, Octavia Solis. And it's, it's, it, it will become a soliloquy, but you won't understand how until we do it together. So first, you're just going to do this simple thing of sort of making a graph. Basically, you're just going to make, you know, say five columns on a piece of paper. A piece of line paper, you know, makes it easier so that you have all these little boxes. Uh, you have a kind of grid. And I'm going to ask you to fill in that grid with various words. Now, if you're already working on a play or um, something long form, I want you to sort of imagine yourself into the world of that play um, so that the field of language you choose is related somehow to what you're working on. And I want you to start by filling inside the box, uh, the boxes, say three colors. So just an example, you're gonna scatter them around. So choose three colors at random, say, and you're gonna just fill them into this grid. I'll give you a second to do that. Then you are going to scatter the word I, not like eyeball, but like the person. I, you're gonna scatter randomly in these boxes, giving a little open space around these scatterings of words. Then you are, are going to choose three nouns. Um, I always think nouns are the most important part of a sentence and Gertrude Stein was sort of the queen of that idea of the nouns. Um, pick three nouns, nice concrete nouns from the world of your play and stick them in liberally. I'm doing it along with you so you get a sense. So, you know, your paper looks something like this. Uh, and I promise this is not a grammar test, but now you need um, three adverbs sprinkled in. Those are the LYs. So your paper should be sort of starting to look, you know, a little more filled in. This is like a Mad Lib soliloquy. You'll see what we're doing in a minute. And now for verbs. And don't think too much about it. And now we really need some ex exclamations. So, um, you know, you're welcome to swear. You're welcome to, um, O is always a wonderful one. Um, if you think of the Elizabethans and the kind of exclamations they had, exclamations of surprise, of, of stopping, stopping the thought. So now you're you're looking quite sort of filled in here. And I think we have um, most of the parts of speech. I'd like you to put in a character's name. Um, it could be the first name that comes to mind if you're not working on a play. Just put in a name somewhere in the box. And then finally, I'd love you to put one place name into this grid. The first place name that comes to mind, like, for example, Rhode Island, or it could be a river, the name of a mountain, the name of a town. So 
Now, now your graph should look something like this. Okay, now you have, say, three minutes, and you're going to fill in the rest of this grid to create a soliloquy. So you can either go across your page by filling in little gaps, or you can go down, but don't skip any spaces. So it's going to be a little bit surreal. You're going to get a, a little bit the sense of strange syntax, but that's actually what we want. So it's going to be odd to have a little silence while we're all working on this, but let's all glory in this strange silence. Um, there's so little silence right now and fill in our soliloquy grids. So one, one word per space. And if you're totally not understanding this, you can also um, use the, um, the chat button, I think, or the, the Q&A button to, to uh, ask Maya a question and maybe she can answer. But keep going, keep try just trying to fill out the soliloquy to make some, some sense of it, even though it's sort of a nonsensical sense. Hey, Sarah, sorry to interrupt, but we have a couple questions coming yes. in. I think everybody would like if you could hold your paper up for a little bit longer and maybe just one more time through explain um, the soliloquy so that anybody who joined late knows how to jump in. Sure. Uh, if you joined late, it might be a little tricky. You might just want to catch up to the next exercise, but basically you should have four nouns sort of sprinkled in through a chart, three verbs, the letter I, a couple of colors, and then you fill in the blank spaces to kind of make sense of it. So just to give you an example, so if I had, if I had the word I here, then I'm going to keep filling in to make to make sense of this grid. So I, I can just read you the first bit of mine. Mary, I hate you. And when I lazily run, hark green, the green I long for grass. So it, it, it takes on a strange meter and cadence because you're making sense of words that are already filled. You're, you're filling in the gaps. Um, between words that you are sort of arbitrarily filled in and you're talking from the point of view of an I. If that kind of makes sense, if, if enough people got it, maybe sharing one will help. Um, are there any folks who want to raise their hand and share what they've got? And I know it's kind of brave, but at least it's audio. We won't see you. So we don't even know who you are. I don't, well, we, we, we might know who you are, but. Hi, Sarah. So we have a few people who want to share. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take Hannah Schrader. I'm sorry uh, in advance if I say anyone's names incorrectly. Um, I'm going to let you talk. And Hannah, you're going to be able to take yourself off of mute. Uh, hello. Hi. You said my name right. Um, <laughs> OK, so should I just like read it? Yeah, read it out. Okay. Green breath, I cry, fuck. This diner is getting emptier. I shout angrily, more pie. And in comes Lacey, cheerily. How, bris how briskly Frankie laughs. She cooks the turkey brown. I am River Bend, Montana. And, ah, no, Christ, sky blue but cloudy. There's no rain. I smile and pink at the edges. Beautiful, gorgeous. Thank you for bravely sharing. And I just want to point out, um, 
One thing I love about this exercise is that they, they sort of all sound oddly Elizabethan because when Shakespeare was dealing with meter or any of those Elizabethans, there, there were, um, the, the way we normally order language gets disrupted uh, because of the meter and, and we're sort of imitating that by um, putting say an adverb in a place where it doesn't normally go. And one thing I loved about your meter, can you just read the first sentence again? Is that too hard to unmute again? Um, green breath, I cry, fuck. Yes, green breath, I cry, fuck. I mean, what's so great about that from an actor's point of view or playwright's point of view, the fuck is so unexpected, but it's also how we think. So there's this theater game called Interrupted Destination where the actor's sort of about to do something and then gets interrupted. And it's actually, um, it happens in life all the time, but it's hard to write into that, uh, particularly if we're planning kinds of writers, it's hard to plan to interrupt oneself. <laughs> um, but, it, but it feels like life because we interrupt ourselves all the time. Uh, I also just wanted to point out how the place name, was it Riverbed, Montana? Um, feel, pops so beautifully in that field of language. Um, there's something about offstage places and offstage names where they exist in the language and then somehow you can see them. Uh, and, and you did that really beautifully. Uh, should we have a couple more? Sure, thank you, Hannah. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Um, so we also have um, Maximilian Howard who would like to share his. So Maximilian, you can take yourself off of mute. Hello. Hi. Hi. Go for it. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, hear this I want, friends. I want the grace pillowly spillowing out upon black eat. Yikes, Ed is I. Sweater pulled down, I kiss you. Ouch, cry, white and black stars quickly burn in tooth. This is my Venice. Shit bleeds out, run red. I can bite your raw jinkies out. And about this is my blaster movie, and you'll do softly how I like. I am your visual director, King, miss. <laughs> well, you see, it made me laugh in a wonderful way because I had so many surprises in it. Normally, if I, I were teaching a workshop um, and all of us were not muted, <laughs> so draconian, um, we would all <laughs> respond and we would all say what images popped. Um, so maybe if I can read my own handwriting, I'll just tell you some, some images that pop for me. Sweater pulled down, I kiss you. This is my Venice. I am your visual director. Are yeah. Visual director, yeah. And how this I want, you know, how this I want is so different from I want this. And we hear the desire almost more fully. I would argue because you are making language strange. And I think that's the other thing about meter is it elevates and heightens language and makes it strange. Hmm. Um, a lot of people think playwriting is just um, writing dialogue that we think is how people talk. But there is no such thing as the way people talk. Um, and so doing an exercise like this kind of invites you into the chewiness of, of language, of heightened language, um, your own, your own thumbprint. Um, you know, some, in some plays, all the characters speak in a kind of heightened field of language. In some plays, each character speaks differently. My teacher, Paula Vogel, would call that each character having their own language recipe or she would talk about defamiliarization of language. So if language is defamiliarized, it makes language feel strange and then it makes language feel delightful. And that was super delightful, Maximilian. I loved it. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more little exercises to do. Um, I'm kind of in the mood to do a haiku just because I've been writing some haikus during um, quarantine just just because it's such a condensed distilled short form I really enjoy it um, <clears throat> here's one I wrote with my son William recently he's 10 I'm just kind of a swallow of water 
<clears throat> so haikus, most of you probably know the first line is five syllables. The second line is sub seven syllables. And the third, third line is five syllables. And in some forms, there are very particular things you're supposed to do with image and breaking the image. But for our purposes, just think five, seven, five. The stores are empty and the theaters are shuttered. My mind is full. Uh, that's what I wrote with William. And then I wrote another one that's a little less serious and it's two haikus back to back and it's called A Riddle, The Answer Live Theater. You can't fast forward it and you can't take a crap while watching it. You must arrive on time to it and yes, you must be fully dressed. So in order to get into a kind of haiku mindset, there's one um, meditation exercise where you breathe in for five seconds and you breathe out for seven seconds. And the idea is that the exhalation is longer than the inhalation, which relaxes you. So that if you focus on making your out breath longer and your inhale shorter, it has a kind of relaxing effect. And I just find it interesting that 575 is also a haiku form. So if we could just take a minute and breathe together, which again is so weird because we can't see each other, but let's just try. So all you're gonna do is close your eyes and you're gonna focus on your in-breath for five seconds, counting in your head to five and your out-breath for seven and your in-breath for five and your out breath for seven and your in breath for five and your out breath for seven and see just checking in with your body see if that had a relaxing effect on your constitution and now I want you to take your pen and your paper or your computer and just see if you can't Think of a five seven five haiku and what I would um, encourage you to write towards is anything you are seeing out the window right now, anything that feels in front of you or present to you right now, anything you're experiencing right now or in this day, in this moment of quarantine, any of that imagery can go into your five seven five. And let's just take about three minutes to write. And keep tapping out your syllables, counting your syllables. And then um, see if you can sort of insert some punctuation in there that makes sense to you. Because haikus are distillations, they encourage us not to think too much. And then when you are ready, if there are any wonderful, brave souls who feel like sharing. And maybe I'll just share mine with you to sort of kick us off and while people are still looking, see if I can read my own handwriting. 
The black sparrow has a red underwing. Is it for battle or love? Um, I've just been bird watching a little bit in Rhode Island and these black sparrows who I see in this little hedge um, have these red markings and um, and you know of course now you can download these apps and identify birds through this app called Merlin and I found out it was called a a black well they're black sparrows uh, with little red things under their arms that's that's about the extent of my bird knowledge um, any brave takers it looks like we have quite a few people who would like Ooh, to share wonderful um, so let's go ahead and get started with Teddy Millen. Teddy, if you want to um, take yourself off of mute, you should be able to share. Hello. Hello. Here's my haiku. Scarved women pick fruit, grazing hands inside the frame. Six feet rulers gone. Mm, so beautiful. I kind of want to hear it one more time. Sure. Thank you. Scarved women pick fruit grazing hands inside the frame, six feet rulers gone. Hmm. It's just beautiful. There's really nothing more to say. Another. <laughs> um, all right. It looks like we actually have another signature artist on here, Joe. Uh, Joe, do you want to share your haiku with us? Yes, hello. Hello. Sunny days are good. The rainy, cloudy ones not. Let's not fight today. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It is so true. That is how we all feel, isn't it? And you'll notice too in Joe's, there's that turn in the third um, line. Like you feel you're going one way and then there's a turn. Let's not fight today, which is, is beautiful. You feel all the space in between the first two lines and that third conclusion. It's great. Another. All right. Um, Susan Sandor, I'm going to take you off of mute. Hello. Hi. Uh, nature all around us today green grass, dogwood, allium, crabapple, lilacs, tulips. The fragrance abounds. Be thankful. Mm. So beautiful. I love the, the specificity of those names of greenery. It's funny how the specificity of those names just takes you into seeing and smelling them. Um, gorgeous, you guys. I think let's suspend our haiku sharing so we can do one more exercise, which I admit is a little ambitious for our form. It's really fun and easy to play in person. It's a little harder um, through this medium, but we're going to use your Q&A um, button and it's it's a game that uh was taught to me through one of my former teachers shira piven who is the daughter of joyce piven who's a wonderful acting teacher in chicago who was my teacher and it's an improvisation game but it's also sort of to do with genre and bending genre and what i love about it is that ultimately i think what it teaches you is that genre is pretty porous it isn't really a thing um i mean it's a thing as long as it's useful and when it's not useful you can throw it out so one thing i love about playwriting is it it is a poem it is an essay it is dialogue it is a song it's all these things together it is a story so in this game and i really think of it as a game we write very quickly and what we do is someone throws out a noun randomly and so someone in the chat button is going to throw out a noun and then someone else is going to respond with what genre we should write in for a minute. So here are the genres I'm gonna give you. So try to keep these in your mind. So the possible genres are poem, essay, rant, song, story. I'm gonna give them again. Poem, story, rant, essay, song. Okay, so let's see if we can make this work. So we're going to turn on our Q&A thing and somebody, oh, and I can make mine show, I think. <laughs> oh, yes, I can. Uh, let's see if this works. So someone throw out a noun, any noun. Oh, look, okay. Cicada. 
We have a cicada. This is so cool. I can see everything. Okay, it actually worked. Cicada, we have enough nouns to go around. Now someone throw out a genre that they think we should write about a cicada. The first genre to come up on my screen will be the winner. So it's going to be either a song, a story, a rant, an essay. Any suggestions? Oh, they're all the, oh, I see they're right there. Okay, a song, a song about a cicada. So you have two minutes to write a song about a cicada. I'm just going to give you another minute. And then look over your song and see if you want to change the punctuation. See if you can read your own handwriting is my question to myself. Okay, would anyone like to share their cicada song? Great, it looks like we have a few people already popping up. Um, Sam Sherman, I'm gonna go ahead and take you off of mute to share. Hi. Hi, Sam. Hi. Um... Here we go. Screechy love, but can you shut the fuck up? Nails on a chalkboard manifested. You will not get the best of me. Don't fuck up my meditation. But what if I surrender? There it is. A song longer than any lyric. Mm. Beautiful. I love, I love where it starts and where it ends. This is sort of a beautiful um, progression. Great. Let's have one more cicada song. Great, Kavita Das, I'm going to go ahead and take you off of mute. Hi there. Hi. Um, mine's very short. Uh, like a heartbeat through the night, cicada sing to the morning light. Hmm, beautiful. And you even got a rhyme. I love a rhyme. And that's one thing that songs get to do that poems don't always get to do anymore because it's sort of unfashionable, but I love a good rhyme. Um, lovely. Okay, let's do another quick, um, quick genre. So when, when people had been throwing out um, nouns earlier, I still have a list of them. So one of them was artichoke. Um, and so what I need to know from you guys is do you think we should write a rant, an essay, uh, a song or a poem or a story about an artichoke? And the first one to come up, I will choose an essay. So an essay about an artichoke, you have two minutes.
Okay, and why don't we finish up our artichoke essays and just why don't we do one more uh, before we share so you can choose which one you like better. Another noun that was thrown out was chicken. Um, what do people think? A rant, an essay, a song, or a story, or a poem about a chicken? Definitely rant, I hear. Okay, a rant about a chicken. You have two minutes. Okay, and finish up the word or phrase that you were on. And would anyone like to share either their artichoke rant? No, sorry, their chicken rant, their artichoke essay, or their cicada song, whatever is your favorite. Anyone who hasn't gotten a chance to share yet, this will be our last sharing moment. All right, looks like there are quite a few people who wanna share. So we're gonna start with Alan Yashin. Hi, Alan. Oh, Alan, I think you need to go ahead and take yourself off of mute. Do you see where you can do that? Yep. Great. Oh, I had raised my hand back in the uh, cicada thing. I think we're long past that, aren't we? That's okay. You can do cicada. Okay. What's your favorite? Bring that up again. Oops, oops, there you go. Um, it's real short. It's, let's find it amongst all this other writing. Ah, <clears throat> think you can drop by every seven years and I'll still be waiting for you? Well, buzz off, baby, because our romance is through. <laughs> oh, how great. I love it. I love it, the personal address to the cicada and how it becomes sort of a love poem. That's great. Um, I also think just, you know, this can be a fun exercise to do among friends or, you know, if you have a theater group, if you have an ensemble, you know, it's something you can play just, it's just to get the muscles loosened. Um, it's the kind of writing that we might not want to necessarily keep, but it's, it's like this wonderful compost heap when you write quickly without thinking about it too much. Um, let's have another. Great. Um, Lindsay Erdhart, I'm going to go ahead and take you off mute. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, I've got a rant about a chicken. Great. Don't get me started on chickens. Jaywalking with no regard for the crosswalk, selfishly putting itself always before the egg. For something so wimpy, a chicken's got a lot of nerve. Birds of a feather, my ass. <laughs> Great, I love the rage. Don't get me started on chickens. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank Why don't you. we have uh, one more, wonderful. Great. Um, Alicia Stone, I'm going to go ahead and take you off mute. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Okay. This is also, this is a chicken rant. <laughs> oh, chicken, please don't give me salmonella. I already had COVID and colds before that. Mm. I'm sick and tired of loneliness. Mm -hmm. Who will I share this chicken with? Mm. Virtual, virtual fingers can't be licked. Mm. What a beautiful um, evocation of where we're at right now. It's great. Thank it's you. Great. Yeah. Are you feeling better? If in fact. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, um, 
I had a mild case, mm -hmm. um, very mild compared to others. Um, but, you know, I'm just hoping to get tested for antibodies at some point. Yeah. So, and um, I have to, and I have to say too, I apologize because I made the mistake that, that people should never make, which is assuming the speaker in the poem or in the play is you. Obviously, you were talking to a chicken, so who knows? What, <laughs> who knows? But thank you for sharing, and I'm glad you're you're feeling better. Um, yeah, thank you. So thank I'm, you very much. Thank you. I'm so I'll sort of wrap up this little section by reading one more poem, sharing one poem for you all, and then we can have a little question and answer dialogue together. Um, so this poem I'm going to read is not in, not in the book, not in my book, but I wrote it during quarantine. I think the title is self-explanatory. It's called Easter Poem During Plague Time. Because there is no fake grass to put in your baskets this year, but there is real grass instead. Don't paint the sky, it's already the right shade of blue. Don't boil the sea into your mouth. Sorry, I said that wrong. I need to go back on that. Don't boil the sea into your broth. There is already the perfect amount of salt. As for the grass, put your feet in the dew. There is not a thing you need to do to sky, sea, or grass, to the blue and the green of them and the everything in between of them. In spring, when birds try to tell you the untranslatable secrets in their song. Um, okay, great. So if you have any questions, um, uh, general questions for me about playwriting, poetry, etc., or any questions about the exercises we, we did, Maya will um, call your questions and, uh, and unmute you so we can all talk. Sure. So it looks like we have a question. I'm going to read out your email because that is what I'm seeing. Um, jkruskin at gmail.com. Hi, thank you. You know, I just have a quick question about, I just wasn't sure what an essay might look like in terms of that mm -hmm. exercise we did. Yes. I mean, what I think of as an essay form is that there's some kind of argument being advanced, some kind of reflection. Um, my mother taught me that the etymology of essay is to try. So it's a little attempt. It's a little attempt in writing to make sense of something. When I, um, when I had twins, I have three kids and I have uh, twins and an older daughter, I wrote a uh, a book of essays called 100 Essays I Don't Have Time to Write, and they're micro essays. Um, partly, I chose short form because I couldn't think um, in long form at that time, which I think is really <laughs> instructive for this time. So, you know, with this game of, 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 you know, this genre game, the essay about the artichoke would be very, very short, and it might advance some kind of reflection or argument about an artichoke. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, we had a question that came through the Q&A from Mac, um, and they're wondering about process um, and how you separate projects and ideas into work sessions, both regularly and then during a time like this when we're in a pandemic. You know, now I can see all the questions. Let's see. Is it in here? Yes. Process it's question. three down. Yeah. Is this from Mac? How do you yes. take the project's ideas into work sessions? Um, and, and it says both regularly and during the pandemic. I mean, I think uh, there's there's a, um, I think, um, is it the, the guy from Monty Python who said there's like five things you need to be creative and it's um, space time, time, and a sense of humor, I think he says. Um, and I think right now it feels for a lot of us who aren't essential workers, like we have a lot of time. A lot of us don't have space. Hopefully we are, have our sense of humor intact, but how do you separate the time? How do you make the time useful? How do you make it your own? 
how does it not just sludge into one undifferentiated mass? I think all of us are grappling with that. And I do think it's something writers grapple with regularly, how to structure time. Um, I found because I have kids, the time between nine to three becomes a time to write. I find for myself, for whatever reason, 10 to 12 becomes a good time to write during the day and even pre-pandemic. And I find two hours a day is actually enough to write. Sometimes it's enough to write an hour a day. Um, Anne Patchett has a beautiful essay in um, This is the Story of a Happy Marriage about uh, her students who ask her questions about writer's block, which she thinks doesn't exist. I kind of think that too, um, because it pathologizes writers in this weird way. But anyway, she has her students sign in um, and actually mark down the time they put butt in chair. And I think that's really useful because sometimes we think, oh, I haven't written, well, you know, uh, I can't write, I can't think. But but then if you actually sit and you you sit for an hour and you try every day and you mark the time, you'll find that that it comes eventually. Um, I mean, pre-pandemic, I would have said that leaving the house is really important, is really helpful to create a sense of work to um, so that you get dressed, so that you leave, so you have a sense of uh, yourself as a worker in the world. And none of us, unless we're essential workers, have that right now. And I think that's really a challenge, but um, getting dressed, going to your desk, um, timing yourself, I, I think can be really useful. I've been doing the Writer's Army, which um, Madeline George and Ann Washburn started, where a group of people come together and usually we write in a room together and now they do it virtually. And it seems so crazy, like why would you want that surveillance? But it's actually quite comforting to see um, old friends um, in the little Brady Bunch gallery and to see that they're all working. And that's something you could do with friends or family and just, you know, you quietly, you can put the mute on and then you just work and you know others are working alongside of you. It's sort of the same idea as when I go to cafes to write, which I do often. Um, that was a very long answer to Mac. Uh, any other questions? We're getting a lot of really great questions and a lot of them are actually about um, how you go from a small idea to, you know, making that initial impulse into a fully realized play or poem or whatever your form is. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that, how you develop an idea and how you stay with an idea even through the challenges of it to get to the end point where you feel like you have a draft that you can work from. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. I mean, I think there are two kinds of playwrights and two kinds of writers in general. Some love the initial writing process of a first draft and others love to do revisions. I tend to be the kind of person who loves a first draft more than I love revisions because I love the process of discovery. Um, but having said that, when you don't plan your plays, which I don't, there comes a moment, usually around two thirds of the way through that I think, have I written a play? What is this? What is the form of this? Is this a play? Um, and that's where the real sculpting begins. That's where you start to really ask questions about what you've written. What, you know, what, what questions is my play asking? What is the shape of my play? Um, to kind of push through that, that two thirds point in the marathon and get to the end. I think you have to really start looking at it um, as, as an aesthetic object and sculpting it. So having the, having the patience and the, and the duration to get to that point can be hard. I, I think having a reading with actors after a first draft is immensely helpful uh, in terms of, you know, going from the, the small image, the seed to a fully realized play. Because I think of, as a playwright, you really don't know what you have until you hear it with actors. And I do think that's one thing I love about going back to poetry writing or short form or, or micro essays is you don't have that long gestation and labor of creating a full length play. You can kind of have the, the rush of, oh, I had a thought and now I have a complete poem or a complete essay. So I think 
it can be a good little sorbet to go back to as a practice. Um, if you if you normally work in longer form to just have a little run at short form for a moment. Other stuff. Great. It looks like there are also some people raising their hands. So Gabby, I'm going to go ahead and take you off mute so you can ask Sarah your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was wondering about some of the sort of genre bending. You mentioned like strange making writers who are most former genre alive or dead. It, it, it clicked on it, but I feel like I see, you said, who are some genre bending, strange making yes. writers you're most excited or inspired by living or dead in any form or genre? Ooh, what a great question. Um, you know, I think, I think most of my favorite writers, and I'm wondering if this is true, write in multiple genres. Um, you know, I think so many, so many playwrights you'll find are also secretly poets. Um, and I'm just trying to think of some, some really wonderful uh, writers who kind of contain all the genres. I mean, one, one person who springs to mind is Sheila Hetty. Uh, who started off as a playwright and then started writing books, nonfiction books, but but they really defy genre. Uh, like how should a person be? Uh, and her most recent book is Motherhood, which is about a woman who is trying to decide whether to be a mother and sort of throws the I Ching and looks at the iterations for an answer. And Sheila is really theater, uh, like um, say Chuck Mee, who's been a signature theater writer, who, uh, you know, you'll see music, song, dance um, inside the, the play. You'll see a, a Socratic argument right there in the play. Mm -hmm. uh, someone like Maria Irene Fornes, her plays really defy genre, uh, another signature playwright. Um, so those, those are three that spring to mind. Thank you. So it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, and in the Q and A, it looks like Anna um, has a question about adapting and translating uh, classic plays and how you stay faithful to the beauty of ancient texts while making room for your own creativity. That's such a good question. And I, I admit I've been thinking a lot about the Greeks right now and going back and rereading um, Greek tragedy because I think the scope of what we're going through right now is very Greek. Um, so Eurydice is the play of mine that 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 um, starts with the Greeks. And I started with a myth of Orpheus and Eurydice and you know, I read the Virgil and I read the Ovid, but I always knew that I was going to have Eurydice speak Orpheus's name and that would cause cause Orpheus to turn. So I wrote towards that moment and there are several moments in the play that are taken from my own life that I think of as sort of artifacts or talismans uh, so that there's this larger mythic structure but there's room within that structure for your own your own thumbprint, your own DNA, your own sense of um, contemporary life and your own sense of uh, ritual and memory. So the great thing about myths is they all have that expansiveness because they're all archetypes. So they're all big enough to contain uh, the individual writer and to, and to make room for our individual languages, our individual voices. Um, so in a way, in a way, you don't have to do much. All, all of that space is already there in the myth. All of that, all of that um, white space on the page is already there for you to fill in. Um, I am going to sort of wrap things up first by saying thank you for being so generous and present, even in a form that is not terribly present. You know, but we're all 
we're all trying our best to kind of fling our fling our voices towards each other and I really appreciate that uh, and then I just wanted to say a quick thing which is that Signature has other dialogues and conversations like this workshops and that one I'm really excited about is tomorrow um, one of my heroes Anna Devere Smith is joining the president of Mount Sinai Morningside to talk about what we're going through so uh, I really wish all of you health and sanity and and writing even if it's writing that you do as a practice and a process and it's meant to be thrown away um, and I wish you um, you know a little bit of um, a little bit of solidarity uh, in all of our isolation and and thank you for 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 chiming in and joining today.